You were a fairly recent watch collector, right? You, you yes. For the longest time, I do believe you wore very, very special watches. You, you, I, know you, you, I know you brought it. Is, is it with you still? Or yes. No? Uh, so you have to see this watch, Agent. Agent doesn't know. No, but I don't know. For the longest time, this is the watch that Dub wore. It's a Casio. <laughs> and Nico, you said you had shout this. Out, shout you, out Nico, guys here. And here. So how long have you had this? Oh, at least 25 years. How long has it been since you got into watches? I guess high-end watches, as we can call them. I would say I started about um, maybe 10 years ago. Which is very recent for a watch collector. If you think of most people you talk to, they usually start extremely young by, you know, first money watch, be it some cheap Rolex for a thousand bucks, which is how it started for me 20 some years ago. Uh, and then slowly but surely the collection sort of graduates. So you dove in about 10 years ago and boy, you dove in pretty hard. We're here to take a look at some of the pieces that Dove has in his collection. And the idea is I wanted to see well, what's actually missing? And maybe try to convince you to go a little bit outside of your comfort zone, because I know your comfort zone is, first of all, is size. You have a very large wrist, 21 centimeters, I believe, and you've always gone after bigger watches. Yeah. So my thinking back at the office, when I went to my vault, I'm like, well, shit, what am I gonna pick up? It has to have the size, but yet to be something different than what it has. And half our cases, stuff, some of the stuff that you already have or had, and the other half is maybe something different. So right. let's start Let's start with your case. Beautiful case, by the way. Right off the bat, you guys are going to see a large size watches, uh, starting with Audemars Piguet, the concept one. And this is not the only concept. You've had various concepts yes. before, I know that. You also have the Legacy, which is the last limited edition that was made for Arnold Schwarzenegger when he was an ambassador for uh, yeah. Audemars Piguet. Hence, they called it a Legacy. Yeah, we and have, the All-Star. And we have the All-Star, which was done for his foundation. It's one of the numerous pieces that Arnold has done for his foundation. He's done the Perpetual Calendar Chronograph, both in white gold and rose gold. Size, I think, is a big factor. But what I mostly see in your collection is Panerai, AP, and Richard Mille. Is there any particular reason with that? I just like those watches. Tool watches. I like the watches that are solid that are they have a purpose i have you know i dive i like dive watches uh chronograph uh and i never ever wear uh, a dress watch i think it's too small too thin it doesn't fit my personality i think everyone should get watch that fits him the same way you buy your car is the same way you buy your clothes your watch should fit your personality not what fits what I, other people exactly Right. And as Roman can tell you, I always buy stuff that I like. I don't care if it's hip, if it's trendy, I buy it because I like it. When Roman got me this uh, Richard Mill uh, wall timer, I know it's not a very trendy watch. I just love it. And I bought it because I, I love the watch. And I think that's, you're right. You always say that you should buy what you like. And, and, and that's and one of the things I love about you as a watch collector is because uh, number one, you look at it from a utility perspective, right? How useful is the watch? Remember guys, don't go back that many years. A watch was just that. It was a tool, yeah. right? And people lost touch with that somewhere along the way and went into the hype, the trend. In my eyes, if somebody bought a round Richard Mille, that means that they are a true collector and a true passionist because if you're already going to spend it well into the six figures on a Richard Mille, people want the recognizability factor. Which is this. Which is this, right? So if you're already buying that, you really put your money where your mouth is. Yeah. So. I, I have a lot of respect for that. That's great. And it looks great on your wrist, too. Thanks. Not uh, surprised uh, you being a diver, not surprised to see lots of Panerai in the collection. And uh, you pretty much managed to collect every big submersible out there <laughs> to include the biggest. And this is, sits at 60 millimeters. Did you actually dive with this one? Yes. In terms of, I know a lot of, I have some clients that are avid divers as well. And I know a lot of them will do, you know, sort of the electronic version that's, you know, it can be super reliable. A lot of people feel that, they want to have the confidence of, you know, something that has a computer on board versus sort of a manual thing. But how useful was this and how was it diving in this thing, actually? It was fun. You have, a, you have a very good visibility. <laughs> no, Adrian. <laughs> no. Oh, I smoke. I mean, I don't know if you can zo zoom so in visibi on that. So visibility is there. Visibility is there, but you're right. You have to watch to wear um, an electronic one where uh, that's connected with, the, with your uh, a tank and they tell you how, many, how much time you have. At the end, it's, a, it's a, also a safety issue. You yes. know, we're not back in 1942 where you didn't have that option, so you can always do, wear both. So it's sort of like fashion underwater, if you think about it. You're able to go with a manual route and also the electronic but route. But you see that the band match the watch. See how thick this is? <laughs> this is, this, this is so I mean, you took, you, did you dive in this uh, yes, strap? Yes, yeah, in this strap, yeah. yes. Obviously, we have a, a slew of other submersibles to include the Bronzo, which Honestly, the blue bronzo, Gorgeous. I think, is probably the best looking 
submersible from Panerai. I'm going to go out on a limb and say that. I mean, I, I do like, if you remember back in the day, they had the original La Bamba, the PM87, which was, the, it was actually very similar to this. It had a blue dial. And when that came out, it was all the rage. That's probably one of my favorite divers. But I'm going to say this is a close second because this is a watch that's going to change over time, over and over and over. It's like getting a brand new watch every other month because, you know, the patina uh, on the bronze will change, of change, course. change throughout time. And just, I've, I've seen some people purposely uh, like not expose, clean it after not clean you it, the expose ocean. it to the elements <laughs> and it just starts to corrode yeah. and it yeah. adds so much character. Now the concept, obviously, my most favorite complication, complicated watch from Audemars Piguet, Audemars Piguet being my favorite brand. I'm super biased when it comes to that, but the concept is one of those watches that sits near and dear to my heart. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna transition into me and Adrian going into the vault and saying, well, what are we gonna pick out? The sure. mini the mini vault today. The mini, <laughs> the, the mini vault today. So I obviously, it's pretty obvious that I went with some of the stuff that you kind of already have. I noticed the Audemars Piguet legacy in the box, the, the, 48, the first 48 millimeter watch that Audemars Piguet made. But that's the last, and I'm always a fan of going backwards and going to the first, which is what I came out with. The T3? Is I came out with the T3, which was the first 48 millimeter watch done by Audemars Piguet for Arnold Schwarzenegger for the movie T3, for obvious reasons. A little bit of trivia for you. Did you know that when you bought this watch? You get the DVD of the movie. But did you, did you also know a lot of people on the secondary market, when they resell them, you get three DVDs. That's actually not correct because at the time this watch came out, T3 was still in the theater. So you only got two DVDs. Yes. And there's an original certificate, like a coupon, that <laughs> they gave you that you can go and cash in for the third DVD, which people yeah. never actually did. Yeah. So I felt that having the legacy, I felt that T3 would probably be a good fit. One of the reasons I love the T3 is because of its weight, because it's done in titanium. The all-star rose gold offshore weighs a ton. Very heavy. Uh, the legacy, even though it's titanium ceramic, still fairly heavy. The T3 is the one watch I felt like could fit into this collection as having the first and the last. And the reason I went with the white dial is they made slightly less of the white dial than the black dial. It was a total edition of a thousand pieces and they made slightly less in the white dial versus the black dial. And the Let same, me go into choice number two for you real quick here. Or are you gonna go right into the concept? I'm gonna go into the concept <laughs> because it's the same theme. Okay, I know go ahead, go ahead, go ahead various concepts throughout the years and you'll constantly keep a concept in your collection and I always felt like again going back to the original right uh, this watch the original concept made out of alacrate this is my favorite watch my favorite complicated watch from Audemars Piguet specifically this alacrate concept we can talk about Renault and Papi we can talk about the dynamic graph we can talk about so many different innovations that went into this watch to include the selector in order to wind the watch, put it in neutral, or change the watch. This is actually very interesting because Dove had made a comment that he does not, he, he's in, in the tool watches, utility watches that he has served a purpose for him, whether it be diving or chronograph if you race. Uh, then he mentioned you're not into elegant or dressy watches, they don't fit your lifestyle. Correct. They're too, they're, they're too small, you said, they're too thin. <laughs> well, here comes the MBNF Legacy Machine Perpetual. Okay. Okay. This is a watch that has the elegant, more or less dressy look on a, on a leather strap mm -hmm. in a precious metal. And considering the fact that you, just in your profession, you're, you're a man of vision and you can actually draw something and make it come into fruition. You can foresee something like this in your head. That's what an independent is. This is exactly what you're holding in your hand, a Max Buser, because yeah. he does the exact same thing you do for houses in his watches. Yeah. Draws them, engineers them. One, one of the things I'll transition to is this DB Thune, if you want to talk about, uh, this is actually DB Thune's entry into the sports world because they were considered to be dress watches. Again, again, they made the watch larger. Obviously, they have the, the, the movable lugs that you see here. One of the cool things about this particular watch is this was the, also their first crack at watches that you can go diving with. This has water resistance up to 105 meters, which is a big deal in the diving world. I don't know how deep you've ever gone. You, you, you go no more than 100 feet. Well, so one of the cool thing about this watch is that most diving watches will have markers that will eliminate, right? Dibby Thune did is this. Ooh, so this cool. watch <laughs> actually has a flashlight in it. Now, mind you, there's no battery in there, right? There's no power. There's no power outside of the power. There's the no spring. battery in there? There's no battery in here. Nope. This is solely done with the mainspring. So it's the mainspring that powers the light inside the watch. Something that That's nobody cool. has ever done. Again, and this is the world of independence, and this is why me, when me and Adrian were saying, let's go figure something out. How do, we, how do we show somebody what seemingly is a dress watch? But this is actually, believe it or not, their crossover into the sports world due to the size and due to the fact that you can dive in this watch up to 105 meters. So welcome to the world of DB2. Did you know that in this dead gauge, mm -hmm. there is a battery? 
Oh, there is a battery in this yeah. depth gauge. The, the depth gauge has, has a, battery. a battery for the depth mechanism. And have, uh, you, have you dealt with this? Oh, yeah. And have, have you found that the depth gauge being fairly accurate? Yeah, very accurate. And this is another thing, is a lot, of, a lot of these guys out there that buy these watches, the tool watches as we like to call them, these things are actually made to work. Like, and there are people out there that actually test them out. So, you know, the fact that you tell me that this is a very accurate depth gauge, I'm sure you tested it against your electronic watch. Yeah, it's actually, it's, one of the, it's it's a, actually impressive. It actually brings me back to uh, uh, the Instagram reel that I did where I was talking about that Richard Mille makes uh, an RM Turbine that measures G-Force, the G-Sensor. Yes. And when they, I they made the, it for the, the rally driver, um, Sebastian Loeb. Well, they made it for Sebastian Loeb, and they also had it for Lo uh, Team Lotus. They had the Lotus uh, with the G-Sensor in it as okay. well. So when I first sold the watch, it was a couple years back, you know, the split second was working, the tourbillon was working, the case was immaculate condition. And then when I when it landed with our client in Asia, I get a WhatsApp early in the morning and he's like, the G-sensor isn't working. I'm like, the what? I'm like, how do you how do you measure G-force, right? I, I don't have an F1 car. And he went like this. He literally went like that with a million dollar watch and he showed the needle wasn't working. But you don't have a G-force sensor in your car? Uh, no. <laughs> <laughs> Last but not least, we're, we're, if, if we want to talk about independence, Airwork is another brand that's, that's near and nice. dear to my heart. And this is probably the biggest one that they make. And again, they sort of bit off the Reverso concept here. So this is uh, their take on the Reverso. Uh, again, sort of for the protection of the watch, so this watch will reverse on either side. Okay. And with that said, they were playing follow. They also dubbed it the T-Rex for obvious reasons because okay. it kind of looks like a dinosaur. But Airwork got his start. Actually, Max Buser has something to do with them. When Max Buser went from Jaeger La Coltra to Harry Winston, he was doing their Opus series watches, which were he invited independent watchmakers, Opus 1, F.B. Journe, started with F.B. Journe. And for Opus 5, he invited Felix Baumgartner, who had the Erwerk watch. Now, the Erwerk watch, the design itself was inspired by the wandering hours of Audemars Piguet. Uh, but he sort of came up with that cube system that kept turning over. And if you look at Harry Winston Opus 5, you'll notice it looks exactly like an Erwerk does today. That gave him a pretty big jump start in order to be able to start his own company. And he's distinctly different. There's a lot of watches out there that take something from each other over hundred years, of hundreds course. of years, they all take something from each other where with independence, you tend to have something different. When you look at an artwork, it's unmistakably that. There's really nothing out there that looks anything like it. I think even with as different as MBNF can be, there's still other independents out there that strive to look like them or have the same sort of look. But Erwick is the one brand that is just so different from any other independent out there. And this one happens to have the size. Uh, I don't even know how many millimeters across that is. And, and, of <laughs> and of course, you being a Panerai guy, I basically said, okay, I'm not gonna impress it with any regular Panerai. So I wanted to say we happen to have the La Sanziato, the Terbion. Uh, and I figured this is probably the only Panerai that would impress you because everything else is in the same you know, diver watch, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. This is technically dressy, the radio mirror, yeah. right? I mean, how dressy can you get with Panerai? So that was the one watch that I thought- Ceramic, might... ceramic is dressy now? <laughs> it's, just, it's just in comparison like, to, 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 the, to the submersibles and things of that nature, it's kind of hard to pick a dressy Panerai to begin with, it doesn't exist. So I wanna, I wanna get your initial thoughts because I, you know, we kind of stuck with, how do we do is the question. Okay, you did pretty good. The, uh, the T3, I almost bought this watch. 10 times. And um, every time, you know, I looked at it, I, I love the watch. I wanted to get one. I wanted, I wanted it for my collection. And then I got for something a little bit better. I don't know if you can say better, but a little bit different. Uh, I like the legacy better. I don't like too much the, the shiny watches. Mm -hmm. I'd rather have like a, a black one ceramic or a, a brushed titanium. Uh, it's a little less flashy, but the white one, it's, it's a very good choice. It's something that I miss and I probably should get. Um, the uh, CW1, it's a fantastic watch. Uh, my brother had one, and uh, you want to tell me how much you want for it? 185,000. Okay. Do you want to do a trade? Absolutely. How much you get for this? In trade, I'll give you 30,000 for it. All right. No, 155 to go. Yeah, 155. <laughs> Before we get into trades, yes. I, wanna, I really want to get your honest thoughts on independence because this is the stuff that's super different. This is the stuff that's really outside of your comfort zone. 
Uh, there is utility to some of these independents, specifically this perpetual calendar, obviously the sports watch, which is a diving watch, actually, believe it or not. I know it doesn't look like one. And obviously something that's out of this world. I want to get your honest thoughts on independence because, again, it's really outside of your comfort zone. I, look, I really appreciate what they're doing. I have, they have some fantastic models. And, uh, and I like MBNF. Um, they're very original. Right now, I don't think it's a good fit for me at this point in my collection. But I am looking at them. I am looking at them. I, I'm very interested. I'm looking at them, looking at what they're doing. I, I love, you know, hearing you talk about, you know, on your video and, and learning about it. About it. But um, right now, it, for me, it's not yet the time. But well, it's take, coming. Take, take the finances out of it. What, because I find, I find I run into the same roadblock with a lot of people. And there's certain collectors, too, that have you literally large just collections. Describe. Right? What... A big percentage of what, your clients, yeah. What, no, I'm saying, what's missing from brands like this to make you pull the trigger? There's something there. I can't put my finger off. There's something. Is it consumer confidence? Your confidence in the watch and the resale value and the what is it? No, I mean, the, the resale value is a small portion of it. Okay. But mainly, I think, is either the history of the watch. When you buy a Panerai, you know that did watch for military, they have all this history in Florence and, and stuff that's very enticing, that's very interesting. And, or when you buy a watch like Richard Mill, I know you always say it's a Formula One on your wrist, it might not be, but it's very technical, the material you use, the feature on the watch, the weight of the watch, that's something that I really like. And I didn't find that yet in, Any other in the independent. I think he just hit the nail on the head lack of notability i feel like that's probably the number one reason why people still they love the watches oh my god this is so well made in the back of every collector's head is like well how many other collectors out there would even know what an mbnf is or what it's an not, would be it's not just that there's there's some watch that i really like uh, uh frank miller i love frank miller they used to do fantastic watches uh i i i had one at, at a point my brother had one uh, today they're not Trendy people are, are, you know. Trendy has a lot to do with it. People, people always mistake trendy for, uh, um, I guess, a flex. And one of the things that a lot of younger watch dealers don't understand is at the end of the day, it's still an accessory, right? It's still an accessory that you want to be trendy, just like shoes, just like a, a, a new suit or a, a certain style of clothing, or whatever, or a pair of sneakers, right? Trends go up and down, up and down. Yeah. And these guys that work outside the trends, they're so different that they tend to set their own trends. And me personally, I think that just as you said, I am starting to now consider them and I'm starting to get into them. This is what's showing me the rise of independence overall because going forward five, 10 years from now, you're gonna see them front and center sort of on that main stage because people will slowly get comfortable, sort of grow up to them, to understand them, to understand what's behind them. And the one main thing I love about independence is they're bringing back the love of horology, the complication of horology. They're spotlighting just how complicated these things that we put on our wrists are. And, yeah, that's really, uh, and this is really what it comes down I, to. I agree, but as a collector, I think before I would go to an independent, I would love to have like one model of each of the big brand, like a classic, uh, a Breguet, uh, uh, a Jeger Le Coutre, uh, you know, all these brands that I don't have, I would like to get one of each. You know, I, I, I want to look at the catalog, look at what they have and say, okay, in this brand, in Breguet, for example, I like the, uh, the Type 20 or Type 21 or the- Type 22 like, now. Yes. So I like this one, I'm going to get one of those. Then I go to Vacheron Constantin, I want this one and, and, and build a collection where I have one of each of the big brand before I go I like to the end. I'm just trying to think of a Vacheron Constantin that would actually fit his wrist. <laughs> it's, it's, well, it's, it's actually well, a, a little uh, difficult. You're, you're French. Do you, I'm going to give you a little bit of a trivia. So the original uh, Brigade that you mentioned was a Type 20. Yeah. Uh, it was made in the early uh, 50s for the French Air Force. Yeah. Did you know why it was called the Type 20? No because the contract number was number 20. That's how creative they were. <laughs> so they made the watch type 20, just a little bit of trivia for you. Uh, so here's, I, this is what I wanted to wrap this up with. First and foremost. How far I, off are we on the trade? No, that's not what I wanted to wrap this up with. <laughs> this, that's not where I wanted to wrap this up. What I wanted to wrap this up with is first and foremost, to thank you for opening the doors to this wonderful, 
I, I don't even know what to call it, Mega Mansion, or just, just it's just a beautiful home. It really is. The fact that for you it starts from a I piece of leave. paper. <laughs> the fact, the fact that it starts from a piece of paper for me, and the fact that you're involved in every single aspect of this house, starting from the foundations all the way out to the last light bulb that hangs in here, uh, is very comparable to that of a watchmaker from start to finish. Every single little detail, and I got to tell you, <laughs> like I said, I mean, there's not a single detail that has been overlooked here. I'm still, I've been here for a couple of hours, I'm still taking in the little details. I think this house is absolutely tremendous. I think it's one of the nicest houses I've ever been to. In the fact, night, what? The nicest the house you've ever only, been to? Uh, what are you talking the about? The only house I've been to that's comparable, I'm not going to say nicer, is I visited Dr. Phil Frost, who lives in Star Island. Okay. In some $50 million house that he lives. That was probably the only house I can think of that's even comparable to something like this. Of course, this is a little bit of rock and roll. It's a lot more modern. Yet, I, I, again, I'm at a loss for words, and I'm usually not. I appreciate you sharing your collection with us. Hopefully, we'll turn the cameras off. We'll make some sort of a deal. I would love to see you in an independent watch maybe five years from now.